Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name's Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. My guest today is Gary Rogers. Uh, he does not live anywhere near where I live, but he happened to be uh, making a trip out here to Utah. And so he came to visit me because, well, you'll find in the story as we are talking that I uh, kept bumping into him uh, uh, one particular day. I had, per- I had purposely worn my Tribe of Testimony shirt and uh yeah he noticed me and i noticed him and we finally uh, were able to connect and i'm so glad that we did because gary's a really cool guy <laughs> like there's a lot of things that we didn't record that he told me and i was just like man you are just an amazing guy so i'm really glad that we could visit and i hope you enjoy this conversation I'm in my home today with Brother Gary Rogers. Uh, We met this summer in Nauvoo, and we kept bumping into each other the day that I was there, so I kept kept asking him if he'd be a guest, and so I kept following up, too. And I'm really glad that he's here in my home today. Would you please introduce yourself, Gary, in your tribal way as much as possible? If it's in your language, great. If it's not, that's fine. Not everybody speaks their language, and some languages are dead. Okay, thank you, Andrea, for having me. Um, I speak very little of my language. I can do the introduction, Dawa Dawa, Gary Rogers. I'm also known as, in in the tribe, as Adoha Yanaisa, which means walking around Buffalo. Which tribe? Uh, Cherokee. Cherokee. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um... Would you please share something that you love about your heritage as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ? It can be pretty much anything, a story, a celebration, a way of life, a ceremony, anything. What do you love about your heritage as it relates to the gospel? That's a tough question. I've been thinking about that since you sent me the email with the possible questions and I'm not as immersed in the culture as I would like to be because I don't live as close as I would like to. One of the things probably I like the most is the fact that the Cherokee Nation was considered the most civilized at the time. And I believe the first one is with, a, with an alphabet or a written, a written language. And I spent a lot of time up in Cherokee, North Carolina, which is the reservation. Uh, I go, we we go there probably three, maybe four times a year for a week or so each time. Um, And I love, I love the history of the whole thing, of how the Cherokee interacted with the European settlers. Actually, that's one of the, that was my key to finding out how I had native blood in me. That was a difficult, um, that was a difficult journey because in 19, I joined the church in 1979 and um, President Kimball was the prophet and he had directed at that time all new members to create a four-generation family tree. Well, I could only do two, maybe three on my mother's side. And uh, the the big stickler was my great-grandfather on my father's side um, because he had loved, they, they were all from Mississippi. Well, actually, as I got into the genealogy, I found out that they, the whole thing had migrated down from the Cherokees I mean, from the uh, Carolinas down in through Mississippi, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. <clears throat> um, but my 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 block was at my great grandfather on my father's side. We knew his name. We did not know 
anything about him because he had just got up and left his family and um, left his wife with three children, or four children, I'm sorry, three girls and one, one boy who was my grandfather. And again, a year after joining the church, I got my patriarchal blessing, which was interesting to me because the patriarchal blessing referenced the spirit of Elijah three times in different aspects regarding my mortal family and my family that has passed on and my ancestry. And I thought that was strange. I, Being a newbie in the church, I didn't know anything about the spirit of Elijah. Who is that? What is that? You know. So I, I started digging around into it, and I found out that it had to do with um, turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, children to the father, and so on and so forth. I was, I was really good with my mother's side of the family. They were all Anglo-Saxons. Um, but my father's family, again, I, the blockage was at my great at my great grandfather. And I worked on that for 30 plus years. Could never find anything on this man. And um, I mean, we knew his name. Um, and that's all we knew. And then I, I, I got down into Miami. I, I was in Miami for 24 years. And I, I got hooked up with my eldest uncle on my father's side, his eldest brother. And even in my youth, he was kind of like my hero because he was a big Navy guy, you know. He was actually a little tiny guy, but he was, you know, at that time he was big, big time, you know, impressive and he had retired twice out of the Navy down in Key West. And um, this is getting to how I found out about the Cherokee lineage. We would have conversations after his, after his first wife died. Um, I took, took time off from my work and went down and stayed with him for about three weeks. At that time, he was in his late 70s. And um, we would have conversations in the evening he was born again christian had been baptist methodist all those things and i was latter-day saint and he respected my faith and i respected his faith and when i would go down and visit with him one time we would go to his church another time we would go to my church and uh, so we had a very good working relationship and communication and uh, one night, this is funny, I, I will never, ever forget this. One night we were talking about the afterlife. What happens when we leave here? And he kept telling me, we're just all going to be angels. I said, no, Bubba, we're going to be families, family units. No, we're all going to be angels. And that went on like four or five times. And finally I got up off the sofa that I was sitting on and walked over to his recliner and I put my hand out and I said, I'll make you a deal. Whichever one of us gets out of here first, find a way to get back and let the other one know he's right. Now, he also didn't know anything about his grandfather, which was my great-grandfather. All he knew was the name and the history that he had just left the family. And I <clears throat> kind of made another deal with him, a side deal that while he's trying to come back, because I knew he was going to check out first. You know, it was obvious. Well, you never know, actually. But when he did pass away, I was by his side. I was holding his hand, and I was talking to him, and I reminded him, we have a deal. Yeah. <clears throat> when I reminded him we had a deal, a tear dropped from his left eye across the brow of his nose because he was in a coma. I uh, had taken a bad fall. Um, and I knew that he'd already been there. When that tear came across, I knew that he had already been there. And that he knew that I was right. So I went back, back to my job after I, actually I had to do two funerals for him, one in Key West and one in Arlington. And um, I went back to my job in Miami 
I had put away the genealogy research for probably about five years because I was just frustrated. I could not get past that point. My mother's side was complete. You know, it was, it went all the way back to England and so on and so forth, but I could not get past the Roger side. And then one night, almost 13 months to the day, I sat down at the computer and I decided I'd punch in my great-grandfather's name. Within two or three um, seconds, I think it was, it was a really strong hit. Oh, well, let me follow this. I confirmed it all. And that led to his parents. And then another one led to his parents. And I, I was there for probably about four hours chasing these leads, just sitting in my computer in my little office at home. <clears throat> and... Uh, then it hit me. Well, it's been 13 months since Jim died. And I don't know how he did it, but the Lord let him come back and open this door for me. Found out that my great-grandfather was the grandson of a principal chief went from the Western Nations, Chief John Rogers, 1837 to 30, 1839. And um, his father was a Scottish trader named Captain Jack Hellfire Rogers, who had married into the Cherokee Nation. And um, he had like five or six wives. <laughs> so <clears throat> he had several children. And then jumping forward, that was in 2008. In 2009, one of my sons, so I'm, we communicate a lot together. We did a lot of things. We, we've we done road trips, just him and I, all over the world. And um, he called me up one day and he says, Hey, Dad, uh, there's something going on in Washington, D.C. You want to go? I said, Yeah, sure. I said, But if we do that, we've got to go to the Congressional Cemetery because I had already found J Chief John Rogers. He is buried in a Congressional c Cemetery in Washington, D.C. So... I said, I'll rent the car, you be here on Friday, and we'll head out. So we did. And uh, after this big rally, we broke away from it and went over to the Congressional Cemetery and walked into a very small little house-type thing that the curator worked out of. We walked in, and she was speaking with some people, and she said she'd get right back to us and when they left, she came over, she goes, uh, what can I help you with? And I said, I'd like to see the, the gravesite of Chief John Rogers. And she looked at me and she said, are you related? And I said, yes, I'm like this third, second, third grandson, great grandson. And I said, I just found out. Well, this woman went ballistic. She drug us all over that cemetery. Really? Yeah. She showed us Chief John's uh, gravesite, his wife's gravesite, his son's gravesite, who was James Rogers. He was the diplo diplomatic liaison from the Cherokee Nation to the United States government. Um, and the Rogers were intermarried with the Vans, V-A-N-N, and um, Cooties. C-O-O-D-Y. And she drug us all over that place and they were they were everywhere. You know. So when we got back when we got back to Miami, uh, I went back to my job and then one afternoon I got a call from a lady and she said, uh, Mr. Rogers, I said yes. And she said, Chief I'm calling from the Intertribal Bear Society. Chief kills like badger would like to see you just out of the blue what and i went yeah that's what i said <laughs> what <laughs> what's this all about she says well you know so and so from washington dc contacted us and said you might want to talk to us or we might want to talk to you so um <clears throat> i called joshua and i told him that the Intertribal Bear Society would like to see us both. 
And so we ended up meeting with uh, Chief Kills Like Badger, which is his given name, his Christian name is Robert Mormon. Mormon. No. You know. oh, uh, huh? Really? Yeah. It's not Mormon like we spell, oh, you know, okay. Mormon, but it's Mormon. It's, it's the English the English name Mormon. <clears throat> and uh, it was actually a council meeting that they were having. And they introduced Joshua and I as the great-grandsons of Chief John Rogers and uh, presented us with the bear claw that you see me where I wear this bear claw all the time um, and presented Joshua with one. I don't know what he ever did with it. I think he has it in his bedroom or something. But um, I wear this all the time. Yeah, that was how I first I uh, first thought that guy. He's probably he's probably native <laughs> because of your necklace. Yeah, really? Yeah. Well, I remember when I when I saw you in your T-shirt, tribal testimonies. I asked you. I said, "What is that?" Yeah. You know, because anything that says tribal, anything that says uh, any any one of the nations, um, anything that says Native American, I'm interested. You know, I'll ask a question. So, what does that um, group do? You said it's the name. What is the name? Intertribal of Bear Society. What does that it's, group do? It's it's a uh, Cherokee based. They basically meet in small groups or collect in small groups wherever they can find members, Native Americans. Now, it's Cherokee-based, but um, they bring in whatever Native American blood that they can find. And um, we have powwows. Um, they're small. Um, but um, in... In South Carolina, there's only like three of us. So we get together once a year and sit and talk, and that's about all. That's interesting. Yeah. And that was that card that you showed me when yes. we were in Nauvoo, right? Yes. Yes. And it um, it has my name on it. It says Intertribal Bear Society. It has my name on it. And on the back, it has the, uh, the uh, Indian Act that says that if you that you're allowed as Native American to wear certain um, prohibited feathers, such as eagle feathers or bird of prey feathers. Um, I can I can fish on the reservation because I know I've wanna gone up and introduced myself to them and showed them that. Uh, so I can fish anywhere on the Cherokee, uh, North Carolina reservation without license. So, it it comes with its benefits. Yeah, yeah. I I did like how you talked about how the the Cherokee are civilized, and I think that that does relate to the gospel because we're taught by our Savior to be civil, to be good neighbors, to be to be a part of the community. We don't have to do the community standards if they're below the standards of a Christian, but we are we're asked to be good neighbors and to be civilized. And I think so, so what you brought about that, I think that definitely does apply to the gospel. So, yeah, I agree. Um, I never thought of it that way, but that's an excellent way of putting it. Um, and if I'm correct in my recall of history, the Cherokee nation were the only one, not the only ones, but the first ones who actually were able to, uh, interact with the Europeans when they came, you know, when they started moving down towards the south through the Carolinas and so on and so forth. Uh, of course, there were na there were tribes up in the uh, northeast that did, but that was only during the war times, you know, that they interacted. Um, but the Cherokee Nation, I believe, actually went out of their way to help the Europeans and understand them and create a relationship. That's cool. Okay. So you mentioned that you're a convert. How did you find the church and how did you, how did you know that it was the right thing and that you should join? The way I found the church was I had gotten married 
And at a late age, I was 27 when I got married, which is pretty late in, in, in let's say, in our LDS culture. Um, of course, I was in LDS at the time, and neither was my ex-wife. But when we had a child, our son, I did not want my family to or my children to go through the dysfunctionality that I went through as a child. I had a tough childhood. My father was an alcoholic and my mother was an abuser, uh, mentally, emotionally, and physically. And I think that's because she didn't know how to deal with the alcoholism and that sort of thing, so she took it out on us. But I did not want my kids to grow up in a dysfunctional family. So I started looking around at different churches uh, looked into the Quakers, and and this is in Hawaii. And oh yeah, yeah. And there's not many, there's not many Quakers in Hawaii. Um, <laughs> yeah. My father, to his credit, as we were growing up, he used to take us to different churches. <clears throat> my mother wanted us to be Catholic, and she eventually won out. Uh, so we were all sprinkled and and uh, sent to Catholic school for a while. That didn't last long because I was always a rebel. So I was I had been familiar or exposed to the Baptists, the Methodists, the Presbyterians. Um, I looked into the Quakers. And then I said, well, let me look into the Mormons, you know, because I hear that they got a really strong family unit uh, philosophy. I went and um, I called for missionaries to come to my home. And they did, and they started telling me about Joseph Smith, and this is in the days when they had the placards. Uh-huh, the flip charts. Yeah, the big flip charts, and you had to go 13 lessons uh, or something to that effect before you could get baptized. And uh, Like I just said, I've always been a rebel, so I wasn't going to 13 lessons because <laughs> I already knew. You know, I knew from the first time that they told me Joseph Smith was a prophet, I believed him. And they gave me a Book of Mormon, and I read it in like three days. I went, hmm, this is interesting. And then the first time I went into the ch into an actual chapel, I had like a kind of a deja vu. And I remember as a child going into a chapel just like that and then breaking off and going to Sunday school because my father had taken us to there. So I uh, did a couple more lessons with the missionaries. I think it was only three le lessons before we were, I was baptized. We were baptized. And uh, I had to, I ended up having to drag my ex-wife kicking and screaming into it because she was not crazy about the idea. But I said, look, this is how we're going to keep this family together. Yeah, hopefully mm -hmm. yeah and um it was good so i was baptized march 3rd 1979 in honolulu hawaii been in the church ever since <laughs> that's so cool yeah what took you to nauvoo this summer when when we bumped into each other were you just sightseeing did you have other things that you were doing well was it your first time there it was my first time there. I had never been to Mal uh, Nauvoo, Palmyra, Kirtland, um, all the places that are, are talked about by most members who either grown up in the church or had been converted. But um, it was something I'd been wanting to do. My, my wife, my current wife, and I, Elizabeth, had been talking about it, and we actually had plans to. Uh, go to the um, Hill Kimura pageant, um, and then COVID hit, and that just that knocked that out, and then they stopped the pageant. So that was uh, that was a killer, but I I said you know we'll make it as soon as there's there are no restrictions, because uh, I don't do well with restrictions. Um, <clears throat> I can take res restrictions and rules from my Heavenly Father and Holy Ghost and Jesus Christ, but man is not going to tell me what to do. 
That's just my nature. So, um, again, going back to the patriarchal blessing and the spirit of Elijah and doing all this research, I had believed for several years when I first joined the church that I was the only member ever. Yeah. I was the first, the first ever one. member. Yeah. But then I uh, found on my mother's side a family out of Tennessee, and something told me that they were LDS. But I couldn't find any any record of it. So, I mean, all of these years that I've been doing the genealogy, family history, looking into these people, going to these different places was always a priority. I was going to get there before I died. And all the work that I'd done in the temples for these people, I think I've done probably a good 3,000. Holy smokes. Uh, ordinances for for your family. My family, my family and, and my, my current wife's family. Yeah. Wow. So it's a big deal. It's a big deal for me. When I lived here in Utah both times, I was at the Provo Temple four night, four days a week, in the mornings before I would go to work, four days a week, um, doing family names and so on and so forth. But So it's always been a real big deal. But this particular time when we met in Nauvoo, my wife, is Elizabeth, is from Trinidad down in the Caribbean. And I'm going to speak about her a little bit here because... She is a pioneer. She is a modern-day pioneer. If you go to look up on the Internet the, the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Trinidad and Tobago, you will see her name sprinkled through there a lot. That's so cool. A lot. She would baptize in London, went back to Trinidad, had a dream, um, a couple days before they were all going to have a big um, reunion. And then she was supposed to stand up and tell them all about the gospel right there. So she did. And her aunt, her mother's sister, was the only person to be baptized out of that family at that time. She was the first person in Trinidad to be baptized in Trinidad. Yeah. Elizabeth was baptized in London went back to Trinidad, told her family, and her Aunt Lucy was the first baptism in Trinidad. So who who baptized her? Um, missionaries. Now, here's the other deal. Uh, Trinidad had not been dedicated for the preaching of the gospel. It, the, the Trinidadian government, um, they change from one socialist party to the other socialist party. They used to be the Commonwealth, but... Um, when Elizabeth went back to Trinidad and told her family there was nobody there to preach the gospel or do baptisms or anything like that. So she wrote a letter, and I've seen the letter, to President Kimball. She didn't ask him to send missionaries. She told him <laughs> to send missionaries. Uh -huh. She said, you need to send missionaries to us now. And so she got a letter back from the secretary and said, yes, what we're going to do is release the missionaries in Caracas, Venezuela, which is just off, well, turned it as just off the, the coast of Venezuela. So what uh, President Kimball decided to do was to release the missionaries from Caracas two weeks early so that they could travel through Trinidad on a two-week visitor visa and they could talk to people yeah but they could not proselyte they couldn't knock on doors so what salt lake did was send names to elizabeth of people who had been to salt lake and signed up for whatever from wherever they had been in an lds area that they got their name from and they would call the people from elizabeth's home and they would come and listen to the missionaries preach that's an amazing story. And they did that for many years 
uh, several years. And so that's how the church got in. And then finally, I think it was um, Russell Ballard came and dedicated the, the land. Wow. For the pre- they, they, you know, the the church has to go through all these, jump through all these hoops with the yeah, governments to to make sure it's up and up. Yeah, so they finally accepted the church, and um, her aunt was the first person to be baptized in Trinidad. She's still alive. That's and, amazing, and she's still active, as active as she could be at eighty four years old. You know. Um. So, when people talk about pioneers, you know. I'm living with one. Yeah. You know, a modern day. Pioneer. Oh, that's why she could wear the dress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but kidding. she I'm just kidding. She didn't like it that much. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um so like I said, going back, we were gonna go to Camora. <clears throat> they canceled that. And again, her being from Trinidad, she doesn't know a whole lot about American history except what I have taught her for the most part and some things that she's learned. Um so I thought it would be a good idea for me to take her on. Well, we decided this year we're going to do an American history and church history tour. Yeah. So we went up to Philadelphia and did all of that stuff. And then um, to Boston, spent some time with my son up there and his family. Uh, we went to the Philadelphia Temple, went to the Boston Temple. Then we drove over to um, Palmyra, I believe it was first. Yeah. We did the Sacred Grove and um, Palmyra Temple. I had her in the Sacred Grove the day before her birthday. I had her in in Palmyra Temple on her birthday. I mean, you can't you can't do much better than that. Um, then we went on to Kirkland, and <laughs> I'm such a wise acre, you know. I I would tell people I'm going to Kirkland. I'm trying to get that temple back for us. <laughs> And I did, you know. I I, t- I told the girl who was doing the tour. I said, "Listen, what's um, what's the possibilities of making a deal here? You know, because this really belongs to us." And um, she didn't quite understand. She was a young girl. So. <laughs> She's like, "What?" And then we went on to um, is it Kirtle in Tunavu, and that's where we met. And so that was the purpose of that whole deal was to get more insight for my wife and the American history and for us both to get more insight with the church and the pioneer heritage. And again, doing the family history, I had found several connections to the early church. One of them being Jonathan Browning from Browning Rifles. They're here in Utah now, but uh, he started in that little town just I think it's just south of Nauvoo, and moved to Nauvoo. I did the tour of that particular place because it's in my history, and, and it was it was it was cool because the the um, the lady given the tour, you know, you know how they are, it's couples on tour and or young missionaries. Everybody's a missionary there uh, on mission, so the lady was given this tour, and she asked if anybody was. Uh, a gun person. Well, yeah, I'm kind of a gun person. Yeah. And she goes, well, how, how do you, are you related to anybody that's famous? I said, yeah, a guy named Jonathan Browning and um, um, a couple of guys named Smith and Wesson. <laughs> another guy, I think, named Winchester. All of them? Yeah. Wow. And that's all through the family history um, and, and searching these people out that's a fascinating thing for me. I mean, I am just, that's that's my Sunday afternoon routine, yeah. is to sit there after I come home from Sacrament. Sit and, there with your family who've passed. Yep. Go on the computer and start looking for them and, and finding them. <clears throat> so, um, that particular tour, the lady was giving us, and we got into the, um, well, she asked the question, and I raised my hand. And then she said something, and she goes, well, you're a Browning. I said, no, I didn't say that I was a Browning. I said, I'm related to the Brownings. And uh, I think it's like 13th cousin or something like that. And um, 
we got to the gun room, the man, the, the, the forge, and they have all these guns behind the case. And there was one gun that I had never seen before. Now I do muzzle loading, black powder shooting. Uh, I'm familiar with all, all modern weapons. I mean, it's, just, it's in the DNA. Um, so there was one weapon up there that she couldn't e explain how it operated. And it was a black powder uh, rifle that had a side magazine. Now, black powder rifles were usually one shot. But Browning had come up with a design that he had a, a side magazine that fed into the breech. But she couldn't explain how that worked. And I'm looking at it, and I couldn't get my hands on it or you right. know, touch it. Right, it's on display. <clears throat> so I just said, you know, may I come up a little closer? And I looked at it, and she goes, can you figure out how it does? And I said, yeah, you see this thing down at the bottom, which was a magazine that was not in the rifle. There was a, there was a magazine in in the rifle, or just being loaded into the rifle. But there was one down at the bottom, and I could see that there were balls in each one of the cylinders, and then on the back of the magazine there was a cap. It's called this is a um, percussion, is what they're called. But I really couldn't figure out how to how it would how it would work. You know, you can't manually just keep sliding it across. So I got up closer to the rifle and I saw that there was a lever. So Browning had created this side magazine, and all you had to do was touch this leather a uh, lever, and it would advance the the magazine over one, shoot, advance it over again, shoot, and so on and so forth. So I explained that to her, and she was. She bought it. I mean, it made sense to me, you know, knowing what I know. And um, all the other people, it, they bought it. I said, okay, that's cool. She took me aside after the tour, and she said, I just want to thank you. She goes, I didn't know anything about guns before I came here. I've only been here for two weeks. Oh, poor girl. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I went, well, you're welcome. I said, I... I didn't want to try and step on your toes, but I mean, you know, if you didn't know how it worked, and you know, if, if, if I could help, I did, you know. So that was that was really cool. I enjoyed Nauvoo. I loved Nauvoo, you know. And then the first night we were there, <clears throat> we went to the first. Uh, you saw the second. We we saw the British one on Wednesday, and then oh, you saw them both. Yeah, we did. Oh, okay. So, yeah, we saw the British one on Wednesday also and then the one on Thursday because we met Thursday morning. And um, so, anyways, the one on – and then we went to the temple Thursday morning. But at the British um, pageant, I went up to the, up the concession stand and I bought a couple of waters, and they didn't have any change. And I said, well, I just keep the change, you know, whatever. I don't care. I had to give her a $5 bill. It was a dollar. They didn't have any dollars. I said, that's all right. Don't worry about it. And the guy standing behind her, he said, thank you, brother. He says, this is for our youth. I said, that's cool. So the next morning we get up, we go to the temple. Guess who's checking us in? <laughs> the same guy that was at the concession stand. You were meant to meet people there. <laughs> I was. I was. And then, of course, Elizabeth is... Um, uh, manager of the distribution center in Columbia. And so there were like three people from North Carolina and South Carolina that come into the distribution center that she saw uh. and talked to. And then the second night, the American pageant, I was walking up the concession and somebody screams across the field at me, Gary Rogers. <laughs> and that was you. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking to myself, who moves me up here? <laughs> yeah. I I got a kick out of that whole day bumping into you again and again. Four times. Yeah. 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 It was meant to be. Yeah. You know, I I I believe that well, we all believe in our faith of a pre existence. And I strongly believe that most of us knew each other at that time but some of us knew each, each other more intimately than uh than others and 
at some point in your life, you're going to meet the persons that you knew in the pre-existence someplace along the line. Like Elizabeth and I, when we met, Relief Society president had fixed us up for dinner at her house. And when she was, we had to explain our histories, you know, tell our histories. And when Elizabeth was telling her history about the church in Trinidad and so on and so forth, I just, I just thought, wow, I'd been divorced for 12 years. I was, I was not looking for a wife, nothing. But I had made a, a stupid joke to my bishop one day and uh, coming out of tithing settlement, I said, you know, he and I got along really well and we joked around a lot. And I said, you know, maybe I should find a wife. I turned the corner, and there she was sitting in the lobby. <laughs> and um, it just went from there. But she had the, had the Rogers last name before, but it was a different Rogers. That's weird. <laughs> now, you, you think that's weird? My name is Gary. What rhymes with Gary? Larry. Larry. Harry. Terry. 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 Barry. Yeah. Barry. <laughs> She was. She, uh, I was. I, I. She was talking to the Reese Society president one day after this whole thing started. We got introduced, and I walked in. And she goes, "Brother Rogers." She goes, "What was your first name again?" And I said, "Gary." She goes, "Oh, my ex-husband was Gary Rogers, or Barry Rogers," and I just thought, "Well, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> That's too much baggage for me." Uh, but I had to rectify it or justify it however you want to say it so i strongly i know about the pre-existence i know about the council and that's why i know about certain people having known each other more closely and there before we got here and that our our paths are destined to cross at some point so I said, uh, I, I made this thing up, and I, yeah, we, we, and she and I both talked about it. We dated for six months, and we talked about it all the time. And uh, I said, look at, you know, when I left the pre-existence, I left first, and I told you what my name was going to be. It was going to be Gary Rogers. <laughs> but you, you were forgot close. The, I, yeah, I, yeah. I said you forgot the first name. You got the Rogers right, but you forgot the first name. You were close. <laughs> But in her defense, she told me she'd be on an island. I went to Hawaii and married a woman who was in Hawaii. <laughs> so, you know, it, it all works out. <clears throat> that's such a funny story. Well, yeah. I love it. That's the only way you can fix it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you're just going, yeah, how did that work? <laughs> so, it's been a good run. It's been a good run. I've I've enjoyed every. Well, most all the time that I've been in the church. I don't think I've had any bad times in the church. Some have been a little uncomfortable, but I love being able to talk to people about the same things. Um, I love this, uh, I love history in general, uh, American history and the history of the church. So getting back to Nauvoo, believe this or not, and I don't know how this works, but the family search started sending me different relatives that had come out of Nauvoo that I was related to, Perkins and these people and those people. And I just thought that was so strange because I didn't sign anything in Nauvoo. I didn't tell anybody I was there. But why would family search be sending me people's names from that place, you know? The only one that I knew about was uh, Browning. That's really interesting. Who in your life has been a great influence and why? I'm going to stay within the church. I think throughout my 43 years in the church, the one person, one prophet, one president of the church that has been the greatest influence for me and that I've learned the most from has been Ezra, Ezra Taft Benson. And I say that because not only do, do we have the same philosophies regarding government, government's role, 
and uh, the value of freedom. But it's just, he was such a wise man. And he went through a lot. A lot of people don't know the upheaval that was in the church at the time when he was the president. A lot of people just were coming against him. You know, a lot of the leadership were going against him because they felt that he was too strong on the on the um, the freedom aspect or the following the Constitution and, and so on and so forth. So I read I read a lot of Ezra Taft Benson works, mm-hmm. and when I'm at home every day, sometimes morning, sometimes afternoon, I'll read uh, one of his talks um, out of one of his many books or one of the uh, teachings. But I think he's been the greatest influence in my church life. In my real life, probably my uncle and his example. Those are wonderful people. Thank you for sharing that. I have one final question for you. What does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? That's a tough question because I've, I'm going to relate a story. I used to teach martial arts. Um, I was actually here in Utah that second tour with uh, two Taekwondo schools here, one in Orem, one in Provo, and overseeing the Intermountain West schools. But when I uh, was asked to go out to Seattle, um, I had I had a big school, a flagship school, and I had a family of Lebanese, two families. Two brothers had been arranged marriage with two sisters, and they had nine kids together. And uh, they were Lebanese, Druze. They weren't Muslim, they were Druze. And I used to go to their house for lunch or dinner, and I would ask them questions and so on and so forth. And I came to realize that, you know, all of those people are all, they're all Jews. They're all Israelis, just of different sects, different tribes. And when I got my patriarchal blessing, I said I was tribe of Ephraim. I went, okay, well, that's interesting. But I've always felt a connection to um, the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And that's probably why um, my friend, who I told you about off off tape, who became the preacher for 40 years for the Presbytery, he was Jewish. He was Jewish. And he and I have had a, a fantastic relationship for 50 years, 51 years. So what does it mean to me to be part, to know that I'm a part of Israel, is the question? Mm -hmm. It means a great deal. It it gives me comfort to a degree. It gives me a lot of, I have a lot of empathy for the Israeli people and for Israel, for the tribes of Israel. And I'm looking forward to... um, when we're all united, you know, not just as tribe of Israel, but the the nations of the Navajo, the nations of the Sioux, the nations of Cherokee, the Huron, Iroquois, and even the Gentiles. Yeah. You know, that's going to be, that's going to be something. And I think it's not going to happen too far distant future. I think we're getting real close. Thank you, Gary, for coming to my house and spending this time with me. Well, thank you. It's been an honor. Uh, I was apprehensive at at first as you, when when you asked me in Nauvoo, I thought, I've been in front of a camera, I've been in front of microphones, do I really want to do this again? (laughs) (laughs) But I'm glad you asked me. Okay, so many things to talk about today. It was General Conference weekend, and 
I have to admit, there were times I had a hard time staying awake and a hard time focusing. It's hard times to do that sometimes with little kids. Even though mine are not teeny tiny, the noise level still is hard sometimes. So my brain wasn't all the way there, guys. I'm sorry. But what I did catch, it seemed like again and again in each individual way, was everyone was trying to tell us, you have to have a relationship with Heavenly Father and our Savior Jesus Christ. You have to know them. They already know you. You have to know them. And when you do know them and you come to to be a better disciple, there will be so many blessings in store. In fact, that's kind of what President Nelson left the conversation the conference with was a promise that we could overcome the world when we truly know the Savior and use the atonement in our lives because that's what it's there for. And I've been trying to tell you that guys too, but I don't have the apostleship behind me to say, yes, that's right. But I'm telling you, they know you. Heavenly Father and Jesus know you. And I too need to use a atonement better in my life. It's just something that I need to work on. But Yeah, so I hope, I'd love to hear what struck you this weekend, if you had any thoughts about it. Uh, Also, if you're not keeping track, I'm going to tell you right now, this is episode 90. We're coming up on episode 100. Um, I already have somebody in, in mind for episode 100, but is there someone in particular that we need to hear from do you guys want to hear anything more about me I talk all the time uh yeah just give me some shoot me some ideas uh or if you have any ideas for Christmas time let me know that's coming up sooner than you might think and and lastly I just want you to know that I'm grateful for each of you who have reached out to me and sent me thoughts um, about episodes or thoughts about things that have come up in your mind or whatever. I just love when you reach out to me. It really brightens my day. And I hope you have a super wonderful, awesome day. Tribe of Testimonies is not sponsored by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The music is a traditional hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear how this podcast is affecting you. And I'm always looking for guests. If you or someone you know would be a great guest, you can reach me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com.